Check one, two, check one, two. So yeah, we all know the story of the Exodus. Just like the flood last week, we all know that story. We all grew up with that story. We all heard it in Sunday school, and even if we didn't hear it in Sunday school, we picked up on it somewhere along the way, didn't we? We've seen the movie. We, we've read the book. We've got the cliff notes and the e-books and heard the stories and all of those sorts of things. Uh, it's one of those tales that, that we all know, that we all hear, that we all grow up with. We get it. So let's zoom on through it this morning. Let's start off at Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> Turn with me, if you will, even if you won't, to Exodus chapter 3. See, the backdrop to this story, the, uh, oh, man, I don't know about you guys, but all week long, instead of turning to Exodus, I've been turning to Genesis, and I've been confused about why there's a woman and a snake in the Exodus story. Anyway, so Exodus chapter 3, the backdrop of this is the Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and Moses uh, as of chapter 3, is a measly little shepherd tending his father-in-law's flock. And, and we're going to skip the burning bush part, because if there's any part that anybody knows of this story, it's the burning bush part, right? There's a bush, and it's burning, and Moses is curious and somewhat pyromaniac-ish, and he walks up to it, and, you know, he, he tries to figure out what's going on here. And we're going to skip straight on down to verse 7 in chapter 3. Then the Lord told him, because he's had this conversation with Moses so far, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. The land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. And we're going to pause right there for a moment. Because th th that introduction, that, that beginning, is, the, is part of the thing that I haven't been able to get out of my head all week. Part of the thing that I just love about the way this whole saga starts, about the way this whole thing starts, is that out of silence, suddenly you hear this groaning. And it's not even that you hear the groaning. There's not this thing going on and there's this groaning. It's not a tree in the forest. God is there and God. God hears the groaning. He's got his ear to the pavement. He's got his eyes on Egypt, on Israel within Egypt. He knows these people. They are his people. He loves them and he wants to protect them. And he wants to give them the best of all things. He wants to give them a land that's flowing with milk, that's flowing with honey, a fertile and spacious land, so that rather than toil away for their slave drivers in oppression, God can bring them up out of this terrible situation they're in and put them in this promised land in this covenant land, put them in this whole new place where they'll prosper and they'll thrive and they'll have new and abundant life. What a great way to start this story. There's this groaning and God hears it and he promises them something brand new. But verse 11, but Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, 
And this is your sign. See, we always, we always kind of stop there with the I will be with you, and then we skip on over to the I am who I am. See, we all know that Moses has his complaints and his frustrations, and he's terrified, and he's, you know, his voice cracks when he talks in front of crowds. He's, he's got a stutter, maybe. He, he, you know, he's not the guy that should be standing up there doing that, because he's just, who's, I'm Moses. I killed a guy, and now I'm here, and I don't want to go back there and deal with that. But there's a really, really vital thing that is what we're centering this reading of Exodus about. God answers, I will be with you. First off, that's the huge thing. More important than anything else, I will be with you. It doesn't matter what your inadequacies are, Moses. It doesn't matter what fears you have, what worries or concerns you have, what downfalls you know you have. God says, I will be with you. That's all you need to know. I will be with you, says God. But there's more. And this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, not if, when, when this has happened, you will worship God right here at this very mountain. They're on Mount Sinai right now. That's where the burning bush is happening. God says, you're going to go back to Egypt, you're going to get the people, and you're going to bring them back here to me. And this mountain is where everything's going to happen. Because this is the mountain of God. This is Sinai. This is Horeb. This is where amazing things are going to happen. You're going to look forward to this, and then you're always going to look back to this. And this is a moment in time that is absolutely pivotal, absolutely pinnacle, This is the mountaintop experience that people always talk about with mountaintop experiences. It starts right here with Mount Sinai. And God says, you're going to come here and it's going to be awesome. You're going to come here and you're going to worship me and you're going to see me like you never saw me before. And you're not going to be in slavery anymore and you're going to be in freedom. Go and do. So then we all know the stories with the plagues. So let's skip the plagues, right? Because there's 10 of them and there's frogs and, you know, it gets icky for a little while there. We're going to skip straight ahead to chapter 13. And what we're going to read is more of in 14, but I, I can't help but start with 13. So starting at chapter 13, at the very, very end of it, in verse 20, the Israelites left Sukkoth and camped at Etham on the edge of the wilderness. All those plagues have happened. All of the worst of that situation has happened. And God has finally gotten Pharaoh to deliver them, to allow them to go free. God is pulling his people out of Egypt. And now they're on the threshold of the wilderness. Now they're getting ready to go and to worship God at that mountain. The Lord went ahead of them. He guided them during the day with a pillar of cloud, and he provided light at night with a pillar of fire. This allowed them to travel by day or by night. And the Lord did not remove the pillar of cloud or pillar of fire from its place in front of the people. Yes, you're going to the mountain. God is at the mountain. This is the mountain of God. This is where it's going to be. But you're coming up out of slavery, and God is going to be there the whole time time. He's going to be in this pillar that is cloud, that is fire, that is smoke and mist and light and bright. And I don't even know what this thing is, but that's God. And God is right there in front of you and behind you and around you. And he's showing you the way through the wilderness to his mountain, to his promised land. This is the direction, the momentum that we've got going. Skip on down uh, chapter 14, starting at verse 19. Then the angel of God, who had been leading the people of Israel, moved to the rear of the camp. The pillar of cloud also moved from the front and stood behind them. The cloud settled between the Egyptian and the Israelite camps. As darkness fell, the cloud turned to fire, lighting up the night. But the Egyptians and Israelites did not approach each other all night. And I'm actually going to stop there, because once again, the next part here is... is you know, the parting of the sea. We all know that part. We know the burning bush. We know the plagues. We know the parting of the sea. These are things that you know, that you've heard, that you've read, and we just don't have time for them this morning. 
but keep them in your mind because these are massively important things. And we're going to skip down to verse 29. But the people of Israel had walked through the middle of the sea on dry ground as the water stood up like a wall on both sides. That is how the Lord rescued Israel from the hand of the Egyptians that day. And the Israelites saw the bodies of the Egyptians washed up on seashore. Sure. I should work on that. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the Lord had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. Other translations say they were full of fear of the Lord. They put their faith in the Lord and in his servant Moses. Ah, all is good, all is right, all is wonderful. We had this groaning, we had this slavery, we had all these bad things going on. Now God has pulled them out. It was hard, there were plagues, there were gross things happening. People lost people that they loved, but now they're delivered. And not only are they delivered, but the Egyptians were defeated. They're all drowned and washed away to the seashore. And now Israel is looking at God saying, yes, Yes, I will serve you for all of my days. This is wonderful. God has given Moses the power to do all these things. God is leading Moses to lead these people to go to his place, but we're not there yet. So let's get there. Let's skip right ahead. Exodus chapter 19. We're going to see all of this come, come to its point, come to its moment this is where the crescendo happens, the exciting. You have to cue the music and make it amazing. 19 verse 16. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud, this cloud, that cloud, the pillar of cloud and fire that's led them all this way, came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from a ram's horn, and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. Moses, let's read that again. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. An entire nation meets with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it from fire, in, in the form of fire. The smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln. And the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the ram's horde grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. What in the world? What an amazing thing that this burning bush is happening at the foot in this cave and this little guy named Moses with his little flock of sheep kind of wanders his way in there and takes off his shoes because it's holy ground. And, and you've got this little tiny meeting place between God and between Moses. And God says, I've heard the groans. I've heard the troubles and the slavery. And I want to bring them up and bring them out. And then you will worship and we will all be together. And look at this. The whole mountain's on fire. There's, there's thunder. There's trumpets. There's lightning. There's all kinds of just crazy, insane things happening right here. And God is right there for the people to see, for Israel to see. And it is good, right? Of course, right. Skip on ahead. After the Ten Commandments, right after the Ten Commandments, Verse 18 in chapter 20, when the people heard the thunder and the loud blast of the ram's horn, and when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. 
what? You're right there. You're in the presence of God. Do you not see how cool this is? That mountain's on fire. This is the God who pulled you up out of Egypt, who showed you all these signs, who did all of these amazing things, who walked with you all along the way. And now you're here. You're in his presence. You're here to worship. And you back off? Are you kidding me? You're right there. You're on the threshold. You have the chance to see the light. And you're too scared to look directly into it. You're too scared to get that close. Don't be afraid, Moses answered, for God has come in this way to test you so that you, your fear of him will keep you from sinning. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. And that's where we are. That's where it stands. That's where this is. The, the once again, in the midst of everything, they have this chance to get right there, to touch, to feel, to know, to hear, to meet God face to face. And they're back. They're in the distance because it's scary. And that's fire. And that was an earthquake. And it's loud and it hurts my ears. And I don't know if I can handle this. So God and Moses spend this time together. And we're actually going to skip all the way down, all the way back to Exodus chapter 4 to get into full context of this. And I'm going to read this out of order as well. So Exodus chapter 34, starting at verse 28, because this is where we're finally going to find our 40 days. Moses remained there on the mountain with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. In all that time, he ate no bread and drank no water. The Lord wrote the terms of the commandment, of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, on the stone tablets. When Moses came down Mount Sinai carrying the two stone tablets inscribed with the terms of the covenant, he wasn't aware that his face had become radiant because he had spoken to the Lord. Does this sound familiar? Because it should. We went through this a few weeks ago. We went through this in February with the Metamorph series because we're talking about what we need to do, how we need to be in God's presence so that we can be totally transformed, so that being in God's presence, spending that time with God, even just on a daily basis, we are going to come away irradiated by the glory of God, by spending that time with God. We're going to become something new knew. But Moses called out, oh, no, 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 no. I skipped a very important verse. So when Aaron and the people of Israel saw the radiance of Moses' face, they were afraid to come near him. Not only were they afraid to approach God, but now they were afraid to approach Moses. And we've got Moses, and we've got God, and we've got them on the mountain, and we've got this stuff going on. And that's how we've read this. That's how we read this for, for our transformation series. That's how we read this to talk about being transformed, becoming white as light, because we need to tap into that presence of God, and we need to approach God. And, and, and as leaders, as people of God, we can identify with this. We can, we can stand here and we can say how much we want more of God, how much we want those mountaintop experiences once again. Or maybe how we've never experienced something quite like that, and we want to experience it in the first place. And as I was approaching this, I, I knew the things that I needed to talk about. I knew the scripture that I needed to preach on, but I was struggling and I was fighting and I was, I was wrestling with God through this whole sermon, through this whole thing. And I couldn't figure out why. I couldn't figure out what it was that was keeping me from understanding what this was. Because ultimately what you've got is a story that everybody knows. Everybody knows this story. You've got slaves in a land that need to be pulled out and delivered, and then they're going to follow God to this mountain, and they're going to worship God, and they're going to go, and it's going to be wonderful, and it's going to be amazing. But what I couldn't get past is that this is the second 40 days for Moses. This is the second time he spent 40 days up here. This is the second set of tablets. And even then, 
there were troubles all along the way. See, it's the second set because the first set that Moses had, God himself wrote these down. God himself just gave Moses the tablets. And when Moses came down, he came down to find a nation of Israel worshiping a golden calf. They're in the presence of God. They see him on the mountain and they, they make this calf and start worshiping it. And it tarnishes everything. We can't get to the end of this and say, look, all is good, all is right. 40 days is wonderful. And we're going to come out the other side really well. Because in this story, in this situation, it's not all good and it's not all right. And there's troubles all along the way. See, throughout the plagues, Israel groaned and they whined and they complained because they didn't want to take, they didn't want to get out of Egypt. They, wanted, they liked the idea. They wanted to see the light, but they were afraid. They didn't want to lose their sight, as the lyrics go. They didn't, they didn't want to go through the troubles. See, the first things that happened was it made it worse for them, and they don't like worse. We don't want to make it worse. We want to make it better, right? Of course, right. We want to move on, and we want to get things better. And then once the plagues were finally done, they rejoiced, and they followed God, and it was wonderful, except that they were in the desert, and now they're groaning because they don't have any food, and they don't have any water, and this is terrible. And they're just a nation of whiny babies, those terrible Israelites. Get your act together. You're following God in a pillar of fire and cloud. Figure it out. So God gives them manna and he sweetens the water and he provides and he shows them the way and it's beautiful and it's wonderful. Except that then they get to the mountain and they can't even do that right. Aaron leads the way in building this golden calf, in forming this golden calf and stay at the foot of the mountain of God where there's fire and earthquakes and they see God. They decide to worship this calf. Are you kidding me, people? Yes, God, just smite them and start over. Except here's the key. Here's what changed everything for me. I was reading this as Moses. I was reading this as God, and I was frustrated with the Israelites, and I was annoyed with the Israelites. And then it hit me, I am the Israelites. We are the Israelites. And that changes everything about this story. That changes everything about this situation. See, during this week, I shared on Wednesday night that I couldn't quite figure out what the situation was because I don't feel like I'm far from God, but I just want to know God more. I just want to want God more. I want to desire him more. I want my soul to long after thee and I couldn't figure out what the situation was. I, it's not like I felt like something was blocking me away. And yet, as the week has gone on from them, I see all these little things. I see all these little things in my life that keep getting in the way. Maybe it's the radio in the car on the way to work. Because I'm listening to that, and I could spend that time with God but I'm walking away. I'm backing up. I'm in the distance because I'm driving and I've got to wake up and, you know, there's other things. I got to catch up with the news and I got to see what the weather is and there's traffic and, you know, I I've got time set aside for God. That's all good. But that's something that gets in the way of God. What is it in your life that gets in the way of God? See, we have this story. We have this situation of groaning and slavery and deliverance and freedom and life. But what we struggle with is especially that very end. And it's not just that very end. It's all the way through it because they're struggling through the slavery. They're struggling through the process of the deliverance. They're struggling through the journey of deliverance and getting to know God. And what we've got is not even simply slavery to freedom. We've, we've got sin and we've got sacrifice and we've got freedom and a whole new life. And what is it that's that sin in your life? What is it that's that thing that's keeping you from God? What is it that helps you realize you are an Israelite in this story? That you're not Moses. You're definitely not God. I'm not Moses or God. I'm not up on that mountain. I'm down at the foot of the mountain. And even worse than that, I'm backing away a little bit. And I didn't realize it until I ran into that thing behind me. 
And I didn't realize it until I got so far away that the mountain looked more like a hill. And I keep backing up and I want to get closer and I want to get closer and I want to feel the heat of God. I want to hear that thunder. I want to feel that roar. I want to know God more. What is it that's that sin? And what is the process of the sacrifice that we're resisting, that maybe we're having trouble giving that thing up? Maybe it's movies. Maybe it's books. Maybe it's music. Maybe it's not even that it's that secular thing in your life that you shouldn't be doing. Maybe it's a Christian lifestyle that has gotten in the way of things. Because I tell you what, I could turn on K-Love and Air One and get just as distracted and just backed away enough from God as I can with anything else in this world. I can get stuck in in all of those wonderful Christian books, C.S. Lewis and Francis Chan, and all of those things in the Christian subculture and be just as distracted from God at the mountain as any other thing in this world. So what is it in your life that's keeping you from God? What is it in your life that has you backing away from God, whether you realized it or not? Because like I said, I didn't realize it until maybe even yesterday that that's what this sermon is all about, that that's the message that God has for us. That yes, we all know the story of the Exodus. And yes, we can look through it and just like the Israelites say, how good it is that you brought us out of the land of Egypt. How good it is that you brought us through the wilderness. How good it is that you brought us to the mountain. And we can ignore the fact that all along the way, just as an addict has have to, uh, is having to let go of the drugs or the alcohol or whatever it is that's in the way, we have to detox from our old lifestyle. We have to detox from whatever it is that's keeping us from God. And that all along the way, we're having trouble letting go. We're having trouble cutting that off. We're having trouble giving that up. And we're whining and we're complaining and we're big babies because we can't see that God is right there with us. He heard our groaning. Maybe he hears us right here, right now, this morning groaning from whatever depths that it is, not even realizing that there's all this stuff between me and God, between you and God. Maybe he knows it and we don't. What is it that's keeping you from God? What is it that's backing you away, that's keeping you maybe afraid, maybe scared, maybe apathetic? What is it? Begin right now, this morning, to give that up, to detox from whatever that is. The other thing we talked about on Wednesday night was how good it is to fast at any point in life. To fast, it, it doesn't have to be this 40 days. It doesn't have to be 40 days. It doesn't have to be food. It doesn't have to be all of those normal things. What is it that even if it's normal, everyday, good stuff in your life, is keeping you distracted from God. Because God will go with you. God hears your groaning. He hears your cry. He hears you saying, I want you more. I want you. I need you, God. He hears our souls crying out to him for deliverance, whether we know it or not. And he's trying to pull us away from that. And he's trying to pull us further and further away from those things into his presence, to the mountain of God. And it's going to be scary because we're comfortable over here and it feels good over here. And it's a nice, warm, safe, secure, that's how it feels right now maybe. And the process of letting go of all of that is painful. It's going to hurt. It's going to not feel the least bit good. But let go of it. And you're going to come out the other side feeling very raw, feeling rough, feeling scared, feeling worried. 
But God is going to be there the whole time. There's no point at which along that entire spectrum, God was not with the nation of Israel. He provided for them with whatever it was. He guided them through whatever it was because he loves them and he cares for them and they are his people. God loves you and he cares for you and you are his people. And all he wants is to bring you closer and to hug you tighter and to love you more. Take this moment, take this time this morning to evaluate, to consider what it is that's keeping you from God. Come forward, stay where you are, pray with somebody else, pray with myself. Take a moment, take a time, take a period, and realize that you are in the presence of an almighty God who will do what ever it takes to seek you out in the midst of your sli- sin, in the midst of your slavery, in the midst of your addiction, and pull you out and pull you close to him so that he can love you more and more and more. Let's pray.